everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this late winter day. I'm Kathy Raminsky, even though it says Lucerto on the uh, uh, um, under my name, uh, I go by Raminsky uh, for the sake of the Sandy Spring Garden Club. Uh, I'm one of the uh, co-presidents, and the other co-presidents is uh, co-president is Marge Combe, Combs. Marge, if you want to just. Um, I just want to say a few things before we get to our program. The first thing is if you want to uh, access the Garden Club on the Sandy Spring Museum website, the website has changed just a little bit. So you uh, go to sandyspringmuseum.org, you click on programs and events, and now there's a banner across the top of the page. and just click on programs and events. It's on the left side of the banner. And, uh, and then you, you will get to the Garden Club um, website on the museum. And we have some, always have, we have our newsletter on there. We have our um, upcoming programs. Uh, so you can read all about us. And those of you who are in the audience now and who haven't joined the museum, please consider that and then you can automatically uh, be a member of our garden club. Um, I wanna tell you about something that is in the near future that we're going to do. We're sponsoring a drive through plant sale. We did this last year and it was very successful and uh, we hope to do it again. And we need a little bit of your help. Uh, if any of you in the audience have um, perennials that you would like to uh, maybe uh, thin out or uh, maybe thinking of giving them away or transplanting them, keep, keep us in mind. Uh, we don't want just one. I mean, like I have Lily of the Valley right now that needs a lot of um, maintenance. So uh, if you can do maybe five, six or more pots, let us know. You can email us at uh, the Garden Club, um, gardenclubmuseum.org. Uh, we have an email that's associated with the museum, and uh, uh, we'll come and pick them up, uh, it, or you could deliver them to the museum. Um, so just keep that in mind. The plant sale is Saturday, May 15th, and uh, you'll be hearing more about it. Uh, today we have a wonderful program. I think we're all excited with the warm weather that we had such, uh, we started to see maybe little sprouts coming up. So here is Stephanie Parkhurst and she's going to uh, introduce our guest speaker. Stephanie is our programs coordinator and she will tell you more about today's program and the speaker. Okay, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate you taking your Sunday afternoon to join us. I am really excited to introduce Carol Allen. Uh, she's a highly experienced horticulturalist. And if you came to our orchid uh, presentation that she did, you will know um, just how entertaining and enthusiastic she can be. So I, I think you're really going to enjoy this. The other exciting part of this is that um, we have roped her into also presenting in April, on April 11th, about roses. So look for the um, notifications of that so that you can sign up um, when that comes around. Um, I, I want to mention that we're going to sort of stop strategically to deal with questions so that we can keep the flow going. Um, and so at some point when Carol gets to, you know, a, a comfortable stopping point, she'll let me know and I will um, sort of field the questions. What I'd like for you to do is write them in the chat box. And I'll, you know, just keep track of them. And then when we take our break, I'll let Carol know what you guys wanted to ask her. Um, and we'll probably have some time at the end for that too, because it's fun to chat about plants. So anyway, I'm going to turn this over to Carol and she's going to talk about spring ephemerals, all of which I'm sure we're dying to see because enough with the cold weather. 
Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm going to go ahead and share screen. So give me just a minute to get that going here. There we go. Let's get this out of the way. Come on, baby. Old computers move slow. There we go. All right, so everyone should see those beautiful blood roots. Yeah, thumbs up. We're good on that. All right. So I have to admit that I'm not um, into current culture, but I did like this quote from Prince, the musician, but life is a party and parties weren't meant to last. And if that doesn't sum up what a spring ephemeral is, I don't know what does. All right. Come on, computer. There we go. All right. So spring ephemerals are plants that complete their life cycle before the leaves on the trees above it obliterate the sustaining sun. Because you know, photosynthesis rules. So how do these plants manage their whole lifestyle in the heavy woodland shade? And we're gonna look into that. Um, this is um, an anemone nemorosa. Yeah, I think this is an, an anemone nemorosa which I'll talk about a little bit later. All right. So again, my computer is just acting slow, be, be patient. All right, so as we know, if you plant any bulbs that bloom in the spring, spring ephemerals also include our favorite non-native, oh, you're allowed 15% and still can be good, and they're called geophytes, geo, earth, fight, love. So earth lovers. And they've adapted this lifestyle for very harsh conditions. So we know that when the soil is cold, it slows nutrient uptake, you don't have pollinators, and then you've got, at least in the mid-Atlantic, we've got this on again, off again, on again, off again climate. That can be pretty tough on a plant. When you think about it, the, the bulk of our plants are going to be growing and reproducing in the warm weather. So how do these guys get away with it, all right? Cold soil, lack of pollinators, unfavorable weather conditions, yeah. So what they have is they've got growth basically in two different phases. Sorry, there are scientific words here today. Hypogeus, growth below the ground, and that's your roots and your buds, and epigeus, vegetative and reproductive growth. So just because we can't see them doesn't mean that they're not doing something underground. All right, so we know that photosynthesis is effective at about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So even though I've got plenty of stuff going on in my yard, because I plant for winter spring bloom, it's what sustains me until the weather gets warm. I know that, that those plants out there are not photosynthesizing effectively because it's not 68 degrees today. It's nice, but it's not 68 degrees. All right, so in the winter we can have low soil moisture and we can definitely have inefficient water and nutrient uptake by these plants because of the low temperatures. But a lot of them have mycorrhizal associates to be able to help move nutrients and water into the plant tissue at these low temperatures. Now, in, as a general rule, the native plants that I'm showing you, and I'm sorry, I haven't been telling you what I've been showing you. Oh, I'm bad. All right. Require deep nutrient rich soil. And that's not so much for the plant. Yes, it is. But it's more for the mycorrhizal. So it's more for the, the microecology in the soil to help facilitate these guys' needs, okay, their physiological needs. So when we have increasing temperatures in the spring, growth will slowly start to come on and then it signals nutrient transfer into the storage organs. So once we get into that 68 degree temperature and these plants start to photosynthesize efficiently, then they're going to have nutrient transfer, then they're gonna have growth, growth, bloom, reproduction, and storage of those carbohydrates. So you all know, so just to review, photosynthesis is the ability of plants to take radiant energy from the sun and process it into carbohydrates, sugars and starches, which then the plant will 
put into storage or utilize immediately for um, growth and reproduction, all right? We love the flowers, they're just having sex, that's all. All right, this by the way is, um, where is this? I'll think of it, ah, anyway, so I've been there, that's my picture. And those are bluets, which I dearly adore, and I do not have the habitat for bluets. So, and there's also some shooting stars down here, just to give you um, an idea. And it looks like some Tiarella in the background. And I'll remember where this place is in just a minute when the brain kicks in. All right. So seed production is often by, fueled by reserves that were stored in the stem. And in particular, in these uh, trout lilies, maturity from seed to bloom maturation is eight years from seed to maturation. So when you go out in the woods, or if you are blessed with a stand of these guys, um, show a little respect, all right? It's been eight years in the making of those flowers. And I know that when I go wandering in the woods, which I do a lot of, um, and I see just tons of these leaves, but actually very few flowers. And now you know that maturity is slow, that it'll be surrounded by the leaves of its pups, its babies, it's seedlings, but only a few will mature to bloom every year. So there is a, a, a process called the vernal dam hypothesis. So that states that capturing nutrients during spring rains and then returning them when the leaves die. And I'm gonna get a little bit on my soapbox right now because the vernal dam hypothesis is kind of what happens to our trees when they drop the leaves in the fall. In the spring, the roots pull up the nutrients, the mineral nutrients from the soil, transport them into the leaves. They spend all summer photosynthesizing, storing nutrients. And then when those leaves drop, they return the nutrients from whence they came. So if you guys have been raking and blowing your leaves and sending them to the county landfill, that's not a good thing. Whenever possible, let the leaves drop and stay. Don't crunch them up, leave them. I know it's a different aesthetic and I know that it's gonna take a long time before people, if ever, get into the realization that when tree leaves fall, they're meant to stay there and they're completing that nutrient cycle. It also keeps that soil microecology good and healthy and that's what helps power all of these pretty things. This is a spring beauty. And I think there might be some leaves of um, white wood aster in there as well. Okay, so wait a minute, they're reproducing when there aren't very many insects out there to help. So they have certain kind of symbiosis. Symbiosis is you help me, I help you type of deal. And they have them with ants. So this is a seed and it could be of a trillium. And you see this fleshy kind of gelatinous thing right here, eliosome. So the ants will eat the eliosome, but before they do that, they carry it off into their burrows, okay? Which are deeper underground, so more temperature moderation. They're probably very rich with ant poop, all right? And they have ants poop too. All right, so it's a perfect place for some of these seeds to germinate. So you've got the symbiosis with ants and that's hepaticas, many of our violets, wild ginger, Dutchman's breeches, trout, lily, bloodroot, the trilliums big time, milkworts and corridalis all have this symbiosis with ants for seed distribution. And the fact that they have evolved with this eliosome just to get the ants to move them around is just, is just amazing to me, just amazing. So it's another one of those tricks or methods that help these plants come on so early in the spring when there are not pollinators, there are not, there are not bird, well, there are birds, but they're, they're busy um, to help them out. So this is kind of cool. All right, now, there are 
a lot of good reasons to allow these plants to grow on our property. And by and large, that's gonna leave them alone. Or if you wanna tackle something like restoration, there's a lot of reasons. So I really, really love the fact that the popular press has, ca has captured this concept of having a butterfly garden, having growing plants for pollinators, the whole concept of the pollinator plant symbiosis and other symbiosis. But we have a tendency to, to concentrate on summer blooming plants. What about the guys that first emerge in the spring? What are they, where are they getting their pollen source and their nectar? Well, this is a yellow lady slipper. Now, not many of us will have the habitat to, to be able to nurture yellow lady slippers, but this and the pink lady slipper happens to be one of the very important sources of nectar and pollen for bumblebees, all right? So bumblebee queens overwinter and they wake up right about now. This warm weather is enough for them and they're grumpy. Come on, they've been sleeping all winter. They're hungry. So what are they going to feed on? Well, the lady slippers will bloom more towards the end of April, early part of May. And it is these flowers that the, that the awakening bumblebee queens go after. And do you notice on this lady slipper pouch, there's a hole. Did you notice that? So lady slippers have this incredible mechanism for getting pollinators to pick up their pollinia and carry it off to the next flower. However, did I mention that bumblebees are wake up grouchy? Yeah. And they're strong enough and big enough that they just chew through the side of the flower to get the pollen inside. So they don't go through the mechanism. The mechanism is that a little, a little bee, one of our little native bees will, or flies, will be attracted to this pouch. Maybe he stands on the edge there and you can't really see the staminoid very, very um, clearly in this picture, but there is a, a fleshy shield and it frequently has a little bit of a sugar substance on it. So the little fly or the little bee says, ooh, I want that. They fly on it, but it's slippery. They fall down in the pouch and go, this is not what I had in mind. But the only way that they can get out is the light will be shining in right through that little hole right there where my pointer is. They climb and then there are hairs that say, go this way, go this way, all right? And they will climb up through that little opening, squeeze the little fat bodies through there saying, I've had enough of this flower. I didn't have a good time. But in the meantime, they'll pick up a little sticky piece of pollinia and off they fly to the next flower where they get equally duped the same way, all right? But bombus queens go, enough of this nonsense. I'm not gonna go play that game. I'm gonna chew through the side mm -hmm. and I'm gonna get that pollen. And that's what they do. So if you ever go out in the woods where there are lady slippers blooming, again, end of April, first part of May, depending on where you are in our area, Look for the flowers with the little holes in the side. Now you know the secret of what's been going on. All right, bumblebees are really, really important early pollinators for a lot of our native plants. This is Virginia bluebells, Mertensia. And you'll notice that the flowers are downward hanging and you go, who in the insect world or the pollinator world is capable of that upside down kind of, of, of pollination? Um, and it's the bumblebees. And again, they'll do, they'll do two things. For one thing, they'll buzz pollinate. So, bzzz, and they vibrate the whole flower. And notice their little parts are covered with pollen where they have vibrated this flower. Now, they too will get irritated with bluebells and they will chew through the side. So that's another flower, first thing in the spring. See if any of those bluebells have a hole right about here and she's your culprit, but hey. She's awakened from a long winter's nap. She's hungry, she's grouchy, and she's got a big job ahead of her. She has to form her colony, lay her eggs, make the workers. She's got a lot of work to do. So she needs, we don't, we don't begrudge her putting holes in flowers. All right, so these early spring blooming ephemerals also serve other beneficials. This is a surfid fly and 
it's feeding on the, on the nectar and pollen from one of our native geraniums. And serpent flies are, are really important to us. There are quite a handful of species. Um, their larvae just feed on aphids. So I do another talk where I talk about the larvae and how they're little aphid vacuum cleaners. So this is the adult form and they're pretty and they do our pollination uh, of various flowers, but the, it's the larvae that are, are really the aphid vacuum cleaners that really help us in our vegetable garden and, and other places where aphids hang out, which is a lot. Here is a bee fly. You may have seen these. You don't know, you know, what is that? You might see it kind of hovering around. It's not a hummingbird moth. This is a bee fly. So see how furry it is, all right? And look, it's got big googly eyes. So when you see something like this, don't be afraid because those big googly eyes indicate that it is a fly. So this is Bombylus major or the bee fly. Again, one of our early native pollinators. And this is a silene that it's, it's nectaring on. And notice it's got that adaptation of that long proboscis to get down in these trumpet-shaped flowers. So the nectar reward's gonna be all the way down there. But in order for this guy to get down there, he's gonna to have to brush up against the pollen and there are some pollen grains on his head. So he's been around and he's doing our pollination. Services early in the spring. And here's one of my favorites. Helicea bees um, are, I love the green metallic bees. Um, they're so, so pretty. And sometimes they'll like to land on you because they like the minerals on your skin. Don't, don't, don't smash. Don't smash until you see the whites of their eyes. Um, that, that too is one of our early, early pollinators. All right. So this is what you can get, all right, with, a, a planting of Mertensia virginica. This is my property. See the deer fence. That's the only way I can have this stand of Mertensia. When I moved, I live nestled into the southern end of Seneca Creek State Park. So I'm surrounded by State Park on oh, about two sides. All right. And I'm pretty well, pretty well safe there. But back in the day, when I first moved in, the Virginia bluebells coated the sides of our local streams and wetlands. They don't much anymore because we have deer, we eat them, and we have lesser celandine who, who outcompete them. That's an invasive alien. But that's what my property is getting ready to do. And today I looked and they're up about this far, a couple inches up. All right. So this is in the trade. You can buy these at probably Merrifield Garden Center, some of the other uh, garden centers where they have not been wild collected. They have been seedling grown or grown through division. I like them because they're erect and clump forming. They like our moist woods um, where I have them. It's kind of at the bottom of a little bit of a slope. So I do get a little bit more moisture there, but it's not wet at all. But you can find them down, as I said, the first place I saw them was along stream banks. And they just flourish, 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 flourish in about, mm, about three weeks. And they get about two feet tall. There are white forms. Um, I think, I know a friend of mine knows where some stands of white, um, white mertensia are, are occurring naturally. But pretty much they're the blue. All right, and I wanna talk a little bit more about these. So as you saw earlier, I have quite an area that is covered by Mertensia. They, um, they propagate by seed. And I don't know, maybe it's those ants that are really, really busy. As long as they stay out of my kitchen, they're fine. Um, but these guys will reproduce. So they'll come up right about now, starting to come up, bloom in April carry on their photosynthesis before the tree leaves get really thick. And by the July, they're gone. So they're summer dormant. And a lot of our spring ephemerals have that kind of lifestyle where they will, they will do all of their growth and their reproduction while the tree leaves are either very small or non-existent, all right? They have all those adaptations for 
doing their, their metabolic activities during cool weather, and then they're gone. They're gone, right? So in this area, in my property, I have the, I have the difficulty of the stand is so thick with there. They have kind of a rhizomatous crown that I really can't grow anything there. There's no room anymore underground. But for a couple of months in the spring, they're up, they're beautiful, and then they're not. So th things to think about if you want to do, if you want to bring these into your yard, remember that they're going to like deep, rich soil with good, adequate moisture throughout, and they're going to feed that grumpy queen bumblebee. So good pollinator association. Another early one is Dodecatheon medea, shooting star. Um, it's, it's about uh, 10 to 14 inches high. Again, miss the moist, rich soil in part sun, part shade blooms in May. There is a white species and there is a pink species. I grow this at the top of a, a rock wall where it likes the good sharp drainage and probably a little bit of the alkalinity. And let's hope I've got some pictures of flowers here. Yeah, so here is white shooting star. And you can see the flowers are upside down. They hang down. Um, this is also Amanella thelectroides right here. Uh, the rue anemone. We have some columbine in the back. That's a Christmas fern coming up. There's some trillium here. And this is Phlox de Vericata in the background. So this is a very, very nice native plant garden that's going to have its pizzazz before May, before June for sure. So that's pretty exciting to me anyway. All right, Thelictrum thelectroides, which is rue anemone, used to be called Ammonella thelectroides. I, 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 when they changed the names, I'm slow to adapt. So it's Thelictrum thelectroides now, or rue anemone. These are some of our smallest spring ephemerals. Um, they're no more than, than about eight or nine inches tall. They love that well-drained humusy soil in part shade, and they're gonna have these dainty little white flowers in April and May. When I talk about well-drained humusy soil, I'm talking about what I call graduate level soil. So if you have a house with new construction, it's gonna take you quite a long time to develop this. So it's not just a matter of adding organic matter and saying, I'm done. It's gonna be adding organic matter and letting those leaves lie and decompose so that you nurture the appropriate microecology that enables these guys to live. So if there's an area where your HOA can't see, all right, it's backyard, you can't bother me there. And you've got tall oak trees or tulip poplars, that's an area, and you can't grow grass anyway because it's too shady. Um, this is an area to let go more natural you will have to battle the invasives. That's just the price we pay for living where we are. But maybe after a few years of developing a good soil with good, healthy microecology, you can start to introduce some of these. Now, a lot of what I've been talking so far are available in the trade. They are artificially propagated. No one is digging out them out of the wild. One that you'll see blooming momentarily, they definitely bloom end of March, first part of April, is the toothworts. And you'll know them, I don't have a good picture of the leaves here, but they are, this is one. So it's very dentate, very, very toothed. These are not them, don't be fooled, all right? And you will find those blooming in the woods shortly, all right? They moved them from dentatum to cardamom species very recently. So it's again, one of those one of those new Latin words that I have to learn. These are very adaptable. Um, Wheaton Regional Park used to have a lot of them. I think there are places in Greenbelt where you'll see a lot of these growing. All right, and here's a better, the, the leaves are unmistakable, okay? Look at, they're kind of a three or four part palmate leaf, all right? and the leaflets are very deeply incised. And the flowers are this lovely shade of kind of pale pink. Lots of different species. Um, 
there's a slender tooth work, there's cut leaf tooth work, tooth work, there's bulbous tooth works. All right, and they're all about the same in above ground look. So they're about a foot tall, bloom in April and May. Again, that humusy, well-drained soil in part sun, part shade. So again, adapted to growing underneath in the shade of tall shade trees, but deciduous, all right? Another one that I love to see is Uvularia perfoliata. I know, easy for me to say. Um, perfoliate bellwort, and we call it perfoliate bellwort because look, the stem of the flower comes through the end of the leaf. So this is called a perfoliate leaf. And we have several different examples in, in nature, in native plants of this perfoliate type of leaf system. But they are a little pendulous, yellow, so probably those bumblebees are a strong pollinator would have to get up in them to pollinate them. And perfoliate bellwort is easily confused with large flowered bellwort. And in the woods, you can have, this is my property, you can tell, look at those, look at those mertensia behind you, all right? They bloom at about the same time, but these guys are bigger in all parts, up to about 16 to 18 inches. And again, loves that moist, humusy, well-drained soil, but the leaves are not perfoliate, not like the perfoliate bellwort. And this one's a little bit bigger. So they're solitary. They don't make huge, huge clumps. They kind of look like Solomon seals and they are kin. So if you say, oh, that kind of looks like a Solomon seal. Yeah, they are. And there's an up close and personal of, oh, that's the perfoliate bellwort very, very dainty, very, very pretty, can make a pretty good show if you've got a dozen or so, but they're not major ground cover. That's not how you would use them. All right, so all of those were native. Now, I love my native plants. And in my perfect world, if we all had about 85% native plants on our property, and we were allowed that 15% of non-native, non-invasive, this would be one of my favorites that I would say, you've got to have this. So this is native to Europe. This is anemone, anemone nemorosa or wood anemone. And it is, it spreads quietly without being invasive. It, the, the leaves remind me of parsley, kind of very crunchy. And the flowers are pretty nice size. I would say inch and a half. And they come in a lot of different colors. So I have carpets of these that come and then go. They will be gone by midsummer. So part of the, of the fun of growing spring ephemerals is what are you going to have to follow them, all right? Sometimes in some of our, of our woodland areas, we have, to, we have to get accustomed to the spaces because the spaces define the plants. Um, yes, a cottage garden has everything cheek by jowl, but sometimes you want a design feature where you've got the spaces, all right, as well as the plants. All right, so again, this is native to Europe, um, four to six inches tall, lots of named varieties. Um, there's a light lavender one here, and there's a bluish lavender one here, and I've got a white one there. So again, this is my property where I have several different colors that I've collected over the years. These are in the trade, so nobody uh, went to Europe and dug them out of the woods. So these have been in, in propagation, in cultivation for a long time, but very, very desirable. And when they bloom, they make a beautiful, beautiful show. All right, so another native, and it's sitting right next to a non-native, this is a pulmonaria or a lungwort. And it's called lungwort because the leaves have splotches on it. So back in the days of um, the herbal manuals where plants would be named for what parts of the body it was believed they would heal. This is called lungwort or pulmonaria, which is ba basically the same thing in Latin because it was believed that it would be a good tonic for um, lung, ailments. <clears throat> lung ailments. And they have lovely shades of, of pinky and blue flowers. You're probably quite familiar with that. And it's coming up amidst a tangle of crocus leaves. So we know that we're now beyond crocus season and this is a blood root, okay? Sanguinaria canadensis. 
And these are lovely, lovely flowers to naturalize in your, your wooded area, part sun, part shade. They are in the trade. Again, you can get them with no guilt. They've got this wonderful leaf with lovely indentations, kind of comes up like a hand. Eight, uh, six to 10 inches tall, um, the flower emerges and then the leaf kind of emerges around it. Flowers about two inches across. And this is probably my stand because I have some that are single and then some that are semi-double. And this is just displaying the natural genetic variation in the species. Um, I've never afforded to afford one of the expensive double blood roots, but they are in the trade if you like the really poofy, poofy ones with even more petals than this. But this is naturally occurring variation, okay? So they bloom in April and May. One that you can see in the woods right now, again, Wheaton Regional Park, Greenbelt, is Claytonia virginica, our spring beauties. And this is what they look like on a bright summer's day or spring day because they will just come out and unfurl in the spring. When it's cold, they're kind of like, kind of lax. And then when it's bright and sunshiny, they'll, they'll gravitate towards the sun. And again, there's a small pollinator right there. Uh, a little, a little butterfly, early emerging butterfly. So again, we're talking about not only things that are delightful, have a cool life cycle, but they support those early pollinators. So that's kind of good. All right. So they're known for their clusters of five petals. All right. Delicate stems. You can see that you've got the buds waiting to unfurl here. And then as they get pollinated, they will tip back down. So when they release the seeds, they go down to the ground, all right? And if you're lucky and you have the right spot, they will self-seed. They actually prefer a little bit more sun um, for, to develop a good clump, but, and you'll see them, you'll see them kind of in breaks of the trees in the woods. And that's their, the little bit more sun that they prefer. All right. So everybody loves trilliums. Man, what's nice to love? This is a trillium grandiflorum, and it's sitting next to a geranium. I probably took that this picture up at the G. Richard Thompson Wildlife Natural Area in Linden, Virginia. And this trillium grandiflorum, you're saying, I didn't know they came in pink. Well, they do and they don't, okay? They open up white and then they age to pink. So when I go up to Linden to look for the yellow lady slippers, it's right about Mother's Day. So the Trillium grandiflorum up there, and there are so numerous that they carpet the woodlands. They go across the drainage ditches in the road and up on people's lawns in great carpets. They're so numerous, it's amazing. You've gotta go there. But you're going to go for the Trillium grandiflorum, you're gonna go the first part of May. I usually go up Mother's Day, 10 days, two weeks into May, because that's when those yellow lady slippers are blooming. So I usually see the Trillium grandiflorum in the pink form because they're fading rather than the white form. So you know that trilliums um, have leaves, sepals, and petals that are all in threes. That's where the Latin name comes. And grandiflorum, you don't have to be a Latin scholar to know that that's big flower, okay? And it's the one that I think everybody gravitates towards. It can get up to 18 inches tall. This is in the trade. You can buy this where it has not been wild collected. And again, if I emphasize has not been wild collected, I really, I really, I really want to urge you to make sure where you source some of these things. If you think that you've got the habitat, you've got the soil, you've got the light, you've got the everything you think to make these guys happy make sure that you're getting them that are not wild collected. So they're not being taken from their native stands into your yard, where hopefully they'll do okay. And there is G. Richard Thompson Wildlife Management Area when Carol goes looking for yellow lady slippers, because you can see all of those trillium grandiflorum are pink, but that's okay. So if you wanna go up and see them in, and this is nothing, this picture is nothing 
you, I could turn the camera in every different direction from where I was standing and then go down the trail and do it again. And the woods are carpeted with white trillium. It is really a sight to be seen. Um, you can see really good stands without having to go a distance on the, on the fire trails. So even if you're not a, you know, a robust hiker, don't think that you have to travel for miles to see this. You can actually pull off one of the, uh, one of the entrances to the fire trails and you can see this without any exertion whatsoever. It is definitely worth the trip. And there are some more trilliums. And I think, yeah, this is my property. So this is gonna be a trillium erectum album. Okay, and you can see that they have a little bit different configuration than the grandiflorums. Uh, the stem is much longer and it's held very, very towards you. And truly, oh, and that's, a, that's um, well, I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Keeping my secrets. Stay tuned for the next slide. You'll find out what that is. All right. And here is tr Trillium erectum. And again, this is my property. And it's that maroon Trillium, but it still has that very, very long stem. And it blooms the same time as the Hortensia because there it is. But I love my Trilliums. I started planting them uh, probably about 40 years ago and the ants have been busy. So I've got naturally occurring hybrids and integrates because I planted about four or five different species. And then I stood back and I let the ants do their job. So this is something that you can definitely uh, grow in the mid-Atlantic states if you've got the right habitat. Yeah, and here's another one. This is Trillium sessile. Sessile is Latin for it doesn't have a stem, folks. But probably that's not a direct translation. You've got that. But look at the pretty leaves. And again, these leaves will be gone by June, July. And there is a tooth work in the background and some corridalis that I haven't gotten rid of yet. So that's um, a, probably an Asian flower plant that was accidentally brought in with some of my plant trades and it's, it's pretty aggressive. So I get rid of the corridalis. I know you people are saying, wait a minute, corridalis? Isn't that the pretty blue one? Well, we don't grow the pretty blue one very well. So the yellow one is pretty rambunctious. So he gets pulled out of my property. All right, so here is squirrel corn. And I love the ferny foliage. This is just absolutely glorious. And again, it'll be gone by July. So here is some, uh, I believe that's Christmas fern. This is not, that's probably cinnamon or royal fern in there. Don't know. Another trillium, one of the sessile types with rhododendron in the back. And squirrel corn looks like this, but not quite. Wait a minute, this is Dutchman's breeches. Wait a minute, you just said that was squirrel corn. Wait a minute, you're changing things on me. Okay, they're kissing cousins and they're really, really difficult to tell apart. So let's see how you tell squirrel corn from Dutchman's breeches. Well, Dutchman's breeches looks like a pair of pantaloons just hanging on the line. And that's Dicentra cucularia. This is Dicentra canadensis. And look, it looks much more like a bleeding heart, doesn't it? And that is squirrel corn. So they both have this really finely textured, deeply incised, kind of a bluish green leaf and these incredible little flowers. Both of them are under one foot in height. And they will both, there's your Dutchman's breeches looking like pantaloons, and there's your squirrel corn looking like a bleeding heart, all right? And that ferny foliage is very, very similar. All right. And there is Dutchman's breeches. That's the, the foliage. Oh, and that's a starry, that's a starry chickweed blooming in that back corner. Another native plant. And no, it's not bad like the chickweed that we pull out. And here is Canadensis squirrel corn. You can kind of see the difference maybe, maybe. <laughs> if I have them side by each, it's really easy for me to tell them apart, but they're difficult to tell apart, but they will form this beautiful ferny mat of foliage. And again, gone by July. And then these wonderful little upside down flowers. So who pollinates these guys? 
some of our early emerging flies and native bees. So these are great things to add to your woodland if you've got the right conditions. All right, so let's just because to show you that, yeah, I'm not all about native plants. Yeah, Lamprocapnos, what? Yeah, I'm afraid those uh, taxonomists were, were added again. So it's no longer Dicentra spectabilis bleeding heart. This is old fashioned bleeding heart. I think every garden should have this, even though by July, it's a bare spot in the garden. And you know what I do with it? Just about that time, I've got some of my big overwintered um, foliage plants and I'm summering them out right where this was. So it's an automatic opening in the garden for me to either put um, a pot full of seasonal flowers that I want to, I want to, um, you know, give them the explanation, exclamation point. Um, but that's how I manage this. Here it is in the spring, very, very early. Mine will start to come up in just a few weeks. And again, old fashioned bleeding heart, absolutely fabulous plant, but a spring ephemeral. And there we go. So it is from Siberia. It can get quite large. It does self sow and it has a very fleshy uh, root. So it's a little bit difficult to, to move, but I find that I will dig up some of the babies and I'll give them to new gardeners. And that's a kind of a, a, a gift that keeps on giving. My patch is 50 years old. So it's, it's about three feet by three feet. It's pretty cool looking when it blooms. All right, on to the next. So this is, this is one of the more, diffi more difficult, it's not more difficult, it's more ephemeral, ephemeral. This is Jeffersonia diphylla or twin leaf. And memorize what those flowers look like because they're the Dickens to photograph. They will come out on an April afternoon. They will be in bloom for a few hours and then poof, they're pollinated, they drop their petals, but the leaves are cool. This is why it's called diphyla, two leaves, diphyla. So I love the foliage. The foliage is cool and the flower is more than just ephemeral. It is like here, then gone. So again, this is available from specialty nurseries and it's a fun addition to your, uh, to your wildflower garden. And again, part sun, part shade. Now, everybody knows mayapples. I'm sure you guys do know mayapples. Potophyllum uh, peltatum. I particularly love May apples because they make a good ground cover in our shady woodlands. And I let them just kind of have at it. They get up to about 18 inches tall. Um, I love the exotic leaves and I love their little white flowers. They kind of dingle dangle down and then you'll, some of them will actually be pollinated and they have a yellow fruit, kind of like a little tiny uh, lemon and it hides beneath the leaves. Now I've been told, uh, I don't have a good picture of the fruit. I've been told that it's edible, but I think it's one of those things that is edible, um, but it's probably going to be a moving experience. So I wouldn't, I would not eat them. Okay, let the squirrels have them, but I love that exotic umbrella leaf. So I've showed you some mostly native spring ephemeral, some of my favorites. So what are our problems? Well, these are our problems. We have invasive plants that have taken over our native areas. I think you'll recall I was talking about the Virginia bluebells when I first moved here 50 years ago and how they carpeted the sides of the stream banks and they don't anymore, partially because of the deer, but also because of this. This is lesser celandine and it is an invasive alien and it has literally pushed out all of our native plants in many of my favorite areas to go looking for native plants. When I go hiking in the spring, I'm looking for these spring ephemerals. So this is a problem. I advise you strongly if you get plants from a plant exchange and you start seeing these shiny little round, half round leaves, with those yellow flowers, bright yellow flowers, 
go through that soil and take out all the little tiny bulblets because this spreads like wildfire. On top of that, the other threats that we have to our native, ter our native um, stands is Norway maple and garlic mustard. All right, there's Norway maple. And the reason this is a problem, and this is planted, we, we were planting this 20 years ago without a second thought. It, it makes a multitude of seedlings. Our native oaks, tulip poplars, hickories, ash, the, the, the tree component that is natural to our mid-Atlantic uh, woods, they do not, they're not good competitors in the shade. They, they might germinate, they'll grow to a certain height, and they really won't shoot up and become a tree until there's a hole in the canopy. Well, what makes Norway maple such an incredible um, competitor is that it germinates a tremendous amount of seed, and these seedlings will grow vigorously in the shade. So they quickly muscle out our native seedlings um, as they start to grow. Plus, we've got the deer component. And I don't know what, what the deer predation is on Norway maple, but I do know that in our woods, we're not getting much regeneration because the deer are eating the oak, the tulip poplar, the hickory, the ash seedlings. And of course, we know what this is. This is garlic mustard. Um, this is a biennial. So if you have an area in, say, an adjacent common area or in your backyard where you see this, this really kind of almost a triangular shaped leaf with all of these little scallops and these white flowers in the spring, at least if you can't pull it out, at least don't let it go to seed. So you start managing the seed bank. Um, if you've got grandkids, pay them a nickel plant but it's got to have the root attached to it. So the first year the seeds will germinate, they'll make a low growing rosette of these leaves. And sometimes right about now they have a little tinge of purple to them. And then the second year up comes the flower stalk and they make a profuse amount of seeds. So you want to control this by pulling and digging, but also don't let it go to seed. All right, so before I go on, do we have any questions in the chat? Um, yeah, there were several, um, Carol. Uh, Kathy asked if she should rake. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, so I understand. I live in the woods. I don't have grass. I got rid of grass 30 years ago. All right. Um, I must admit, you know, riding on the riding lawnmower was fun, but I realized very, very quickly on my slightly sloped property that I was causing tremendous amount of erosion. I had enough shade, I couldn't grow a good stand of grass, and I was eroding the soil. And I went, this is not right, this is not good. So I stopped. And what I did is I just, I covered the entire area with four to six inches of arborist wood chips, and I let the leaves fall. And I've been doing that ever since. So no. We, we know now that we have our, all of our beautiful moths, like our Luna moth and um, some of our other big, beautiful moths, they hibernate in those leaves. So if you pulverize them, if you rake them, you're actually breaking that life cycle. So okay. if you have an but, area that you can- My question out. is that uh, I, my property is nowhere as large as yours. Uh, the, uh, is there fungus under there? Is there, are there ticks under there? I didn't rake this time. And now I'm, um, should I rake now? No, just leave it? Yeah, okay. just leave it. Okay, so ticks. Ticks are a reality because we have both deer and we have white-footed deer mice. And they have an, the ticks have an alternate lifestyle where when they're juveniles, they actually prefer these, these small rodents. And then, then they like to go to the larger warm-blooded mammals when they're a little bit bigger, although they're pretty indiscriminate. So one of the best ways to control ticks is to get tick tubes. Now you can buy these or you can make these, but this is a cardboard tube and it has um, cotton batting in it. 
And that cotton batting has been liberally dusted with pyrethrin. And the mice want to use the cotton batting. It's very attractive for their nests. So they take the pyrethrin infused cotton batting into their nests. And they have actually found, studies have found that that is a pretty darn good way to help control the ticks. And then definitely things like um, barberry. If you've got barberry, cut it down, get rid of it. First of all, it's an invasive alien. And secondly, it forms wonderful um, sheltering spots for the mice that grow the ticks that da 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 da. So you can control your ticks in some pretty low impact ways, um, making your habitat for mice a little less desirable, um, providing the mice with this cotton batting that's infused with pyrethrin. There are hacks on the internet that tell you how to make them out of, out of toilet paper rolls. Yeah, you can do that. Or you can buy the tick tubes. And I heartily recommend those. And keep the deer out. Fence your property. Oh, I love them. No, I don't keep them out. I let them come in. Then you're going to have ticks. They are part of the life cycle of the tick. And Catherine, you may think Bambi is beautiful, but Bambi's got a dark side. And I know a number of people who not only have Lyme disease, which they will live with for the rest of their lives, but babesiosis and a lot of the other tick-borne disease, diseases. The tick-borne diseases have exploded up and down the East Coast. And the Mid-Atlantic and New England are epicenters for tick-borne diseases. So keep Bambi out there, way out there, way, way out there. And don't let that tick breeding part of beautiful Bambi in your yard because, yeah, tick-borne diseases are, are no joke. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, it, but your timing's perfect on that. We just had a presentation from um, one of our garden club past presidents about um, pests and how to sort of easy ways, natural homemade uh, remedies. And she mentioned the tick tubes which I had never heard of, so. Yeah, what you don't want to do, absolutely do not want to do is do not cover spray. Give Mosquito Joe the boot. He doesn't work very well and he kills everything, everything. Don't let, don't, do not fall for their sales pitch. So no cover sprays, people. If you need to get a pest taken care of, then zero in on that pest and try to outwit it. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and I think um, the other question was, how do you find out about them? I and you mentioned YouTube, um, as well as Amazon. Has, yeah, well, um, you, can, you can buy the tick tubes on Amazon, but the hacks are all over the internet. And yeah. I made my own. I, I saved up all of my paper towel rolls and my toilet paper rolls, and I cut them into pieces, and I spray painted them to give them a little bit of water resistance. And I got a package of cotton balls and fluffed them out, put the pyrethrin in it, stuffed them, and then I put them in the sheds. I put them in the, um, in the stack of firewood. I put them in any place where I knew that mice would shelter. Mm -hmm. And I definitely saw a drop off in the number of ticks. Now, it's been a couple of years since I've done it. I have to do it again because I've already picked a tick off of me just walking to my car. Oh, so <laughs> yeah. I have yeah, to do it again. A few warm days. We didn't have that cold a winter. No, um, we didn't. No. The other um, question was about um, deer eating shooting star. So oh, yes, they, they do. They love it? There is not a deer resistant plant on this planet. <laughs> and you go and people hand out, you know, these lists of deer resistant plants. That's that particular herd that hasn't developed a taste for it or hasn't been desperate enough to eat it. I, Helleborus, Helleborus hybridus orientalis. Those are deer resistant, right? I have a friend in Damascus. The deer come through and take the flowers off. Oh, yeah. So you see all of those deer resistant plants, sooner or later, when the population gets high enough, they will eat them. Yeah. So fence. Fence is really, really, it's no longer, again, with the, the uptick in tick-borne diseases. Uptick, tick, I did that on purpose. Um, it's no longer just protecting your hosta. You're now protecting your family. Yeah. It's yeah. serious. That is my least favorite insect. So, oh, um, mine too. Mine yeah. too. Yeah. All right. Well, let me, let me go on. Okay. We'll Sounds good. Thank you. More. 
my pleasure. We'll pick up some more questions at the end. All right, so this is a common blue violet. And you're gonna go, oh, it gets in my lawn. My husband goes berserk. It is my favorite placeholder. So I just cleared out an area that just because of the derecho and some other things that happened, a corner of my property where some English ivy had gotten in and my life got too complicated for me to take care of it. We just cleared it out. I will let these come in and they will be my placeholders until I bring in other plants to cover the earth. You have to have something on the ground to keep those invasives from coming in. So I love my violets. This, this is the common blue. Now, this is not native. Well, uh, this is arguable. All right, this is Viola Walteri, and you can get these in the garden centers. Um, this is actually Asiatic, it is believed to be, with these lovely uh, veins in the kind of the blue-green leaves. And then I have a lot of the yellow violets, both the downy yellow and a few of the other species. And I let them proliferate. Viola canadensis, the Canadian white violet, is really, really good at filling those, those spaces. So this is a good one to cultivate. And I also love our Asarum canadense, wild ginger. This may be deciduous, but I still love the way it comes up and it has these wonderful heart-shaped leaves. The flowers are little tiny kind of maroon things underneath the leaves. And they will, you can, if you lift up the leaves, you can see them. But this makes a great native ground cover. So between the violets and the wild ginger, they make great, uh, great ground covers in our native, our native area. And I particularly love Pachysandra procumbens. Our Pachysandra terminalis, we have learned, is too much of a competitor in our gardens. It's particularly rough on our native, our, 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 on our azaleas. But the Allegheny spurge, Pachysandra procumbens, is not as aggressive, and it's got these lovely, lovely mottled leaves. Takes a little while to get established, but wonderful, wonderful mottled leaves. And curious white flowers. And then, of course, there are the ferns. This is our native polystichum acrostichoides, Christmas fern. And that will be coming up momentarily. And they are wonderfully evergreen. Um, so it's a good evergreen kind of focal point in the midst of all this deciduousness. All right. And another favorite of mine is the northern maidenhair fern. And that likes those shady areas where the moisture accumulates. And I have a stand of it, not on my property, but down along Berryville Road near the Seneca Creek. And it is just so, so delicate and beautiful. Now, I've been talking about spring ephemerals. And I mentioned, then what do you cover them with? Because they're going to be gone by July. So white wood aster blooms like this in August, September, and into early October. So when you think about supporting pollinators, I've been talking about the early, early spring ephemerals, but then we need to provide the pollen and the nectar for the late season, all right? And uh, Arabia de Vericata, white wood aster, does that job really, really well. And this is in some pretty dense shade and it is competitive. And again, supports those late pollinators. There's your leaves. Now, what I like about this is the crown is that rosette will sometimes be semi evergreen and it holds the soil on my slopes very nicely from erosion. And remember erosion is a problem. There is a mixed tapestry of all kinds of spring ephemerals and summer cover plants. So you've got, I've got a little bit of Brunera in there. I've got some uh, trilliums. Um, so there's some daffodils back there. This is a whole bunch of plants and there's some, uh, so those are white, white violets. So there's a whole bunch of plants that can form this mixed tapestry that makes a great shady ground cover. I do not get any alien plants in there. It's heavy enough that I don't get any of the invasive aliens coming in. So if you want to develop and maintain what I call the spring ephemeral tapestry, which I just showed you, so you're going to be 
waging the war continuously against invasive species, several of which I've mentioned. The way I started was I used tub ground hardwood chip mulch, arborist mulch, all right? Not commercial hardwood shred, all right? I got it from the arborists and it's high in lignin. It takes a long time to break down and that's actually what you want. And I spread that out and then I let the tree leaves fall and remain there so that they completed the nutrient cycle. And then as you think about adding the species, you want to think about, are they appropriate for your particular setting? You do not want to use any soil amendments. You do not want to turn over the soil, all right? Actually, there's a lot of good science behind soil amendments are not necessary, particularly in this application, because every time you turn the soil, you actually destroy the soil structure and it has to remake its, its, its soil structure. And this is an area that you will not fertilize, do not fertilize at all. Our, our chemical fertilizers and even our compost when applied heavily, right? First of all, composts are high in phosphorus and phosphorus is the number two pollutant in the bay. So think twice before you add compost, all right? Don't apply it unless you absolutely need it, okay? Because of the high phosphorus levels. But our chemical fertilizers mess up that soil microecology that we're trying to grow because all of those plants I was talking about need that soil microecology. And a big dollop of be patient, all right? Be patient. It takes a, a while to convert that, I'm not growing grass very well underneath these trees to that spring ephemeral tapestry that I just showed you. All right, I have to give uh, credit to some of the images that I borrowed. They're from Jim Fowler. And if you don't know Jim, you want to. He has not only books, but he has a wonderful blog. He goes trekking, uh, he and his partner, all through, I think it's probably North and South Carolina, photographing native plants. So if you love native, native wildflowers, you want to follow him. Very, very, very cool. And then a few of them, were mine. Okay, they were mine as well. And with that, I would love to take questions. We did have um, one here about um, the conditions that the Pachysandra and I... Procumbens. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What kind of conditions does that like? Pretty much the same as I've been talking about. That nicely organic, well-drained woodland soil that you're gonna to have to start developing if you're gonna like get these guys to get a toehold. If you're starting from scratch, put in your may apples, put in your, your violets because they're, they're not as picky as say the trilliums or the squirrel corn or some of those others. And I found that Mertensia, Virginia bluebells, doesn't seem to mind clay soil at all. <laughs> but you're, you're going to want some of that organic matter. Um, I really steer you away from store-bought hardwood shred mulch. It's been, been treated with lime. And these guys do not want an alkaline soil. They want an acid soil. That's our native, that's generally our native soil in, the, in central, central Maryland. You know, we're going to have a pH of about 6.5, all right? And the hardwood shred mulch, it's going to come in, I've tested pH on the bagged mulch and the bulk mulch almost as up, up to eight. So these bags of shredded mulch may not be doing what you want them to do. So for people who are not quite ready to bite off the, oh, I want that spring tapestry and let all the leaves fall, um, I suggest find a pine shred to use in your garden. Use a pine shred because that's naturally acidifying. Catherine, lovely, lovely ginger cat there. Um, curious also about um, is is um, are you talking about cedar mulch or is it something? No, no, no. Okay. not cedar mulch. Don't don't spend the money on cedar mulch. There is no advantage. Um, pine shred or pine fines mm -hmm. is available in most of our major garden centers. Probably not Home Depot, but don't shop at Home Depot anyway, please. <laughs> Support your independent garden centers. You know, go to Merrifield, go to, you know, go to Homestead. Yeah. 
And um, do you have recommendations for where we can purchase the plants that you've talked about today? Merrifield Gardens and Homestead mm -hmm. are going to be able to supply a lot of those. And also, I'm hoping that with the vaccination, that we're going to see more plant sales like we used to have before COVID. And um, there are a whole bunch of local plant sales where people will bring in, um, vendors will bring in native plants. Mm -hmm. So keep your eyes peeled, um, they're out there. Um, I was very disappointed to learn that um, Green Springs Garden Farm Park in, our, in, in uh, Virginia is not having their spring sale. Mm -hmm. And I would see several vendors who, who do propagate these plants, bring them to, um, to that sale. But hopefully Green Springs will be in the fall because hopefully enough people will be vaccinated. Yeah, and we can go back to um, normal life. Sort of whatever that was. Sort of whatever that be. is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the next question is about crocuses. Are they from bulbs? Because- Yes, uh, yes. Yes. yes, those are geophytes. Gotcha. So yes. Definitely. And what about snowdrops? Cows of course. I had tons of snowdrops. In fact, right before this meeting, a friend of mine came and I dug some snowdrops for him because I have fields of them. Yeah. That's the no, are, they, are they from bulbs also? Yep. Okay. Yep. But now the crocuses, I mean, they're do they spread or somebody who I mean, they're all over the place. Yes, they do. Oh, okay. And you know, Catherine, one of the fun things about crocus is that our little meadow voles and our mice like them, but they don't eat the whole bulb, but they'll take and store bulbs in their little, you know, their little storage area. And then you'll find somewhere in your yard will be this whole bunch of crocuses in bloom. And I didn't plant those there. How did those get there? Yeah, it's yeah. the mice moving them around. So years and years and years and years and years ago, I was up at Longwood Gardens in about this time of the year. And I had, they, they had in those, they've remodeled a couple of times, but they had an embankment. As you go up to the conservatory, it's not there anymore. And they had that planted with a crocus lawn. And I went, I have to have that. So that's what I did with the little remnant of lawn that I have. The grass is gone now, but the crocus is still there. And I have fields and fields of crocus. So if you haven't planted crocus, you need to. You can actually, they will commingle okay with lawn, probably not zoysia, because zoysia has a really pretty um, heavy root system, but you can actually grow those in a fescue lawn. Just your first cutting, let cut it pretty high until some of the leaves start to um, complete their life cycles and refurbish okay. that little bulb. Uh, someone mentioned that Rells has pine vine. Yes. So, um, Good place to check. Um, yeah. Any other questions? No? Give it a moment. All right. I don't know if you have any last words. I want to remind people that April 11th, you'll be back talking about everything roses. Yep. Um, yep. yep. And uh, thank you so much. You're very welcome, guys. And you know, you, you can always contact me via email if you have any questions. Um, I would be happy to answer them. So thank you very much for having me and have a good afternoon. Oh, thank you, very you too. Much, Thanks so thank much. You. Thank you very much. You're welcome you. very much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>